disclaimer. For some help, I went on Wikipedia, and I read the articles there. But for specific topics and specific areas that Wikipedia just will not do, I went straight to their source material or source material that I myself have personally in my possession. And for that, and those specific topics, I will provide references in the links down below. Please see those. Mind you, all of this is taking place over many, many years. This didn't all happen in one fell swoop for me. This is something that I have known for many years and things that I have become slowly disillusioned to the idea that the Bible was this perfect representation of the Word of God. So, part one, the Bible is made up and forged. Specifically, I'm going to be looking at the New Testament here, but I might be going back and forth a little bit in some other areas. So, starting off, the oldest books of the New Testament are not the Gospels. Yes, they come first, and yes, I was taught that they are the oldest books, because they document the earliest part of the New Testament, you know, the birth of Jesus up to his passion and death and resurrection. Then you have the Acts, then the Epistles, and then the Book of Revelation. I was raised Catholic, so we called the Apocalypse, the Book of the Apocalypse of John. The oldest books of the New Testament are actually the Epistles of Paul, the ones we can actually attribute to him. I'll get back to that in a second. These were written about A.D. 50 or so, according to paleographers. That's 20 years or so after the death of Jesus. 20 years. Back in that time, that's a lot of time to have passed. And you would think that during that time, certain things could have been added or maybe even embellished to the story of a man named Jesus who lived and died and then rose from the dead. In fact, Paul rarely mentions Jesus at all in his epistles. In fact, very little is said about what Jesus actually did. He does claim to say that he rose from the dead, but there is very little documentation of his early life, his miracles that he worked, and his teachings. Why is this? Well, for starters, Paul never actually met Jesus. As for the conversion of Saul into Paul, you have one version, Acts 9, verse 3 through 9, where the followers of Saul hear a sound, but they see no light. And then you have another version, Acts 22, verse 9, where the followers supposedly don't hear a sound, but they see the light. Seeming contradiction. My conclusion? Neither happened. The man simply had a stroke, saw a light, and had a radical shift in personality. This is actually a well-documented phenomenon. People will have a stroke of some sort, and then will undergo a radical fundamentalist approach to religion or politics. I can give personal testament to this with the experience I have with my landlord, who after his mini-stroke has now a very outspoken attitude towards politics, and in fact will get extremely angry to the point of shouting and almost violence at anyone who even questions his politics, let alone disagree. I myself have almost been thrown out of the house that I rent from them, merely for stating a belief of mine that was not very different than his own. My opinion? This is exactly what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. Nothing more than a stroke. So moving on to the Gospels. The earliest Gospels that most historians can agree on that was written is the Gospel of Mark. It's actually a pretty plain, straightforward, simple Gospel. Not a lot of frills, but very detail-oriented. And keeping a pretty detailed account of the facts of Jesus' life and his miracles. And then it ends. Just like that. And that's where the controversy starts. You see, Mark 16, verse 9 through 20 is agreed upon. And it's been agreed upon for quite a long time, for over 100 years, by both church historians and paleographers, that it was written at a much later time. In fact, it doesn't appear anywhere in the Gospels until at least the second centuries. So, at least 40 years after Mark was written, the last 12 verses or so were written. So Mark seems to have been written about A.D. 70 or so. So that's 40 years after Jesus supposedly died. Now, I think that's plenty of time to have a little embellishments created. In it, Jesus is portrayed as an apocalyptic prophet, not the son of a god and a mortal woman, 
nor God himself. He does claim at the end to be the son of God, but then so did Heracles. Moreover, Mark actually seems to have been written originally in Latin, and indeed he certainly does pander to the Romans. For instance, you have Jesus telling his followers at the temptation of the Pharisees to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, and that unto God which is God's. Pay your taxes, in other words. This is a Roman sentiment that would go well with Roman readers. Indeed, Pilate is painted as a weak and ineffectual leader. Not the fault of the Romans, but the fault of an individual man. And indeed, his characteristics are something that the Romans could look down upon as weak-willed, foolish, and pandering to mobs. And then, of course, you have centurions who seem to be making cameos all over the place. Matthew and Luke, now, seem to have been written about the same time, anywhere from 80, 70 to 100, but there's some disagreement on when exactly, though more seem to agree between 80 and 85. Although, frankly, I don't really care at this point. John is agreed to have been written around 80, 90 to 100. However, there are some that claim it could be written as late as A.D. 125. The idea behind this is that none of these Gospels were written even close to the time of Jesus. They were 40 to almost 100 years removed from him. If these are the Gospels that are the accurate representation of the life of Jesus Christ, they were written well, well beyond his actual lifespan. How accurately do we actually remember things that happened 40 years ago? 50? 75? 100? We forget a lot. And 40 years ago, even though we have video recording of events, we still have urban legends. If you don't believe me on this part, just think of what happened to John F. Kennedy. What really happened when he was assassinated? Do we actually know? We don't. Another issue that I found were not all of the books that are attributed to Paul, called the Pauline Letters, were actually written by Paul. What? Forgeries? No. Indeed. In fact, seven out of the 14 letters that are typically attributed to Paul were not written by him. Only half were considered verifiable. Those are Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, and Philemon. The rest are pseudographical, meaning some anonymous guy wrote them, said that Paul wrote them, and they are written in as, okay, Paul wrote those. And the one, Hebrews, which has been acknowledged as anonymous for a long time, was still traditionally associated with Paul, even though there was no proof at all that it was Paul. It even said that it was Paul. If this is a sort of history that interests you or excites you, then I urge you to go check all of this out. This is the stuff that really captured my attention, the history behind it. I love history, and this is what really got me looking into what actually happened. It's fascinating reading to discover the early politics of an emerging religion. Well, if half of the epistles of Paul are outright forgeries, well, who wrote the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Well, unfortunately, all we have is tradition. Tradition holds that Mark was the disciple of Peter, and, traditionally speaking, he was also the young man in the Garden of Gethsemane who ran away naked when he was grabbed. What he was doing in the garden with only a little small towel on, my guess is as good as yours. Although, if I had to wager money on it, probably getting laid. That's simple. Who buy? Who cares? And of course, the Gospel of Mark does not claim that it was actually written by Mark. It's only attributed to Mark. Just like some of the epistles of Paul are attributed to Paul but are absolute forgeries. If you want a real world example of a work that was attributed to a person but turned out to be a forgery, let me please point you to the Hitler Diaries. I hear you can pick them up cheap. Matthew is agreed upon by historians and paleographers not to have been written by any sort of eyewitness and in fact is almost entirely a ripoff of Mark and the document Q, and in the case of Mark, word for word in places, with a few little embellishments thrown in. 
both Matthew and Luke both write in a nativity, which unsurprisingly contradict each other. Go figure. The Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles were apparently written by the same guy. This at least historians, paleographers, and church historians can't agree upon. However, Luke was supposed to have been an, a disciple of Paul, and yet in Acts, he actually snubs Paul quite often, and in some cases, directly contradicts Paul's epistles. If he were a disciple of Paul, one would have think that he would have at least mentioned Paul's death around 65 AD to 68. Either Paul was alive still when he wrote these books, or he just didn't give a shit about him, which is a possibility. Go figure, huh? Political infighting among religious sects? No. As to John, historians and paleographers agree this was not written at all by an eyewitness to Jesus, as it supposedly claims. It is also radically different in style, theology, and borrows heavily from the, the Greek idea of logos and borders on the heresy of Gnosticism, which claim to reveal deeper mysteries and hidden knowledge, a redeemer, redemption for our sins, etc., etc. Does any of this sound familiar? Sound familiar? Yeah. That was actually the, all the beginning of Christianity. Deeper mysteries, deeper knowledge, hidden meaning. It's called the Gnostic heresy. Look it up. If you're interested in that, I recommend the Gospel of Thomas, whose writing actually predates the four canonical Gospels. Some scholars seem to think that it was written as early as 30 AD. Huh. Jesus was alive, supposedly, at 30 AD. Hmm, so this could be a more accurate description of what Jesus actually talked about? Huh. I wonder why it didn't become a canonical gospel. Quick synopsis. It reads like someone just taking a bunch of notes of Jesus' teachings. It's just sayings of Jesus in parables. Very little is actually speaking about what he did. Also, absolutely nowhere in there does it mention his death or resurrection, which would have been impossible if this was a guy just taking notes of Jesus' sayings. So, the possibility of being more historically accurate? Check it out for yourself. You decide. And if you want a really fun read, I recommend the Gospel of Judas. Yes, that Judas. Judas Iscariot. Seems to be he was framed. Moving on from there, we come to the First Council of Nicaea. This is where things get really interesting. One historian, Tony Bushby, seems to think that this is where Christianity actually had its beginnings. And that it was a amalgamation of Britonic and Eastern religions that were combined into one using the Britonic Jesus God and Krishna to combine and form Jesus Christ. Whether this is actually historically accurate or not, he does provide some very interesting topics to at least consider. Constantine Urusibus, I think I'm pronouncing that right, the historian at the time. Um, there are some compelling arguments to be made. I'm not sure if I agree with everything and all of his conclusions, but definitely something that warrants more investigation into. So the council was overseen by the Emperor Constantine, and all 1,800 bishops at the time were invited, though numbers of as high as only 300 actually showed up. Some people claim that as little as 120 showed up, so a very, very small percentage of the total number of bishops and leaders of the church. Whereas the council did not actually order the canon of the Bible, Urusibus, in his Life of Constantine, does seem to suggest that this is where it was at least put forth, controversial as it is. Regardless, after Nicaea, which concluded in AD 325, Constantine had 50 copies of the Bible ordered and printed up in 331. And this is the first time we ever hear the term New Testimonies which is where the term New Testament comes from. Whether this was only the New Testament, whether this was the New Testament and the Torah, whether this was just a collection of some of the epistles, we don't actually know because none of them have survived. The Synod of Hippo, 
So according to church teachings, the Synod of Hippo is actually where the canon of the Bible was set forth. And the Third Council of Carthage ratified this decision in AD 397. That's 360 years after Jesus died. 360 years, they finally get an idea of what books they want to have in their Bible. Now, which books were tossed and which books were kept and why? And honestly, that would take way too long to actually go over. There are so many political ramifications of what books to keep, Gnostic heresies, books that just didn't have any place to fit in. So instead, I will point you to a book that I found just absolutely fascinating. This book is The Lost Bible by J.R. Porter. And really, it's just a synopsis of the lost books. It's not the full content of all the lost books of the Bible. It goes through stuff like the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Thomas, to give you an idea of why it was rejected from the canonical Bible. So, contradictions in the Bible. Oh, sweet baby Jesus, where do I start first? Now, Catholics believe in this handy little device called ex cathedra. Not catheter, cathedra. Totally different things. It's a Latin phrase meaning from the chair, which typically refers to the throne of Peter. It also could possibly refer to the throne of Moses. What it means is that the Pope, as head of the church, who sits on the throne of Peter, speaks infallibly and cannot make a mistake, cannot err in matters of faith and morals when he speaks ex cathedra. As a man, yes, he can err and he can make mistakes when just speaking as a man or as a priest. But when he speaks ex cathedra on faith and morals, the Holy Spirit will not allow him to make a mistake. Despite the obvious arguments against free will, we're going to move on from there. How do Catholics support this? Well, Bible, of course. Matthew chapter 16, verse 17 through 19, Douay Rim's version. And Jesus answering said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, because flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, it shall loose also in heaven. So this is the reasoning of how Peter and the other apostles could abolish certain rules and laws from the Old Testament against eating pork and gentle mutilation. Circumcision, that is. But what does it really mean for today's society, besides fuck all? It means even if you want to only use the Bible, you can't. Because what the church decides is right and just and good. God also decides is right and just and good. By the way, this is how the doctrines of the Ascension, the Assumption, the Eternal Virginity of Mary, and the Divinity of Jesus were proclaimed. With, you know, certain rules being let slide like cutting hair, dick slicing, eating pork, and the Sabbath being on Saturday instead of Sunday. Another political reason, if you want to look into that, it's fascinating stuff. Still, all of that is contingent upon that one little Bible verse, which as I already discussed, was copied badly from another Bible and probably embellished upon in order to give the early church a little muscle. And sadly, if this one part of the Bible is true, the Catholic Church has it right. They are the original surviving Christians. And apparently God has already given them the power to just completely mess with his laws. They are the original surviving Christians, and they can trace the lineage of the popes, supposedly all the way back to Peter. And if that verse of the Bible is correct, everyone else is wrong. Everyone. They have the power and the authority. They are correct. Now, of course, there is another opinion, one that I hold. It's all bullshit. All of it. For example, there is zero archaeological evidence to support anything 
in the Bible, other than there are actually places mentioned in the Bible that happen to exist or do exist to this day. Names. They got names right. Gold Star. And sadly, they rarely get the geography right, as if they didn't really have accurate maps, you know, that could be seen from above from like a satellite or a bird's eye or a god's perspective you would figure that god would have at least given them the accuracy that he would have seen himself looking down on the world i mean he could have at least revealed it a little bit maybe and then there's the completely historically shoddy work that we see in the two varying varying differences of the birth of jesus first in luke chapter 2 1 through 39 According to Luke, Caesar Augustus was emperor. Caesar died 19th of August, 14 AD, and he was emperor from 27 BC to 14 AD. And Quirinius was governor of Syria. Okay, now we have some historical references to put this against. You want to quote history? This is what happens. Quirinius was appointed the governor of Syria in 6 AD when Herod Achilleus, the son of Herod the Great, was kicked out. He was governor until 12 AD. Luke says that Caesar took a census, which is wrong. Quirinius took a local census, not a worldwide census, as Luke seems to claim. So we're already off to a bad start. Then look out, here comes Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 2, verse 23. He just threw Herod the Great into the mix. Oops, that is inaccurate. Herod died in 4 BC. Did you catch that? Jesus was born in the time of Augustus when Herod the Great was king and Quirinius was governor of Syria. Sorry, that's not possible. Quirinius was only governor because Herod's son was banished. Strike one for biblical accuracy. Strike two is all of Genesis, but I'll go into further detail into that crock of mythology in my next video. And strike three is the undeniable evidence that parts of the New Testament are outright forgeries. It's undeniable by anyone with any bit of scholarly background. These are just a few examples, but I really wanted to use the strikeout analogy. So what? I will leave you with these for now. Until next time, I love you and you're awesome. I'll see you soon.